peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar Imhotep, with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology, and this is the Mbongi. And today, we're going to have a brief lesson on how to properly read the classifiers in the ancient Egyptian script. And we are going to use the word Kemet from the Cahun Papyrus as a focus of our discussion and to bring about uh, certain details that many of you may not know, even if you are familiar with uh, how to read and write the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. So all that and more when we return in just a moment. And I just want to welcome each and every one of you to the program. And uh, you could be anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here with me today. So I appreciate it greatly. And always, I like to start off the conversation by acknowledging those of you who have joined the chat and have made yourselves known. And so uh, we are streaming live today on YouTube on X, aka Twitter, and uh, on the Asarm Hotep Facebook page. So shout out to everyone uh, joining from those three platforms. And so love and light, as always, to Sister Tamika One. Thank you for being in the building. And Dasha Rob is in the building. Peace and blessings to you. We got Florida Baby 97. He says or she says, he or she, I don't know quite yet. Um, you got to drop the song titles. Indeed, indeed I will. Uh, and I'm assuming you're talking about the the intro music, uh, which we will do indeed. And we got with us uh, Octo Thorpe. And I hope, you know, I think there was a, a hurricane or something that hit out in Florida. So I hope you and, um, and Sister Mika you know, are, are doing well and all right uh, out there in the southeast part of the United States. So uh, today is going to be a lesson. And thank you, Sister Mika, for reminding everyone to thumb up the video, like and share and subscribe if you have not just yet. So uh, what's today's focus? is on the the word Kemet here. And this particular version of the word Kemet that you see here with the uh, Kim hieroglyph, the T suffix, plus the sitting man and woman with the plural strokes has been a, a, a source of contention, you know, for quite a while. And it is the sole basis of Shekanti Jope's 1977 argument, which he actually, you know, made, well, I, I should say like in, in one, of, he, he kind of hinted at it in an earlier work, like in, a, in the 50s, but he also mentioned it at the famous Cairo Symposium that was held in 1974 in Egypt. And so uh, the, he, argued that the word Kemet meant uh, came from a root Kim that meant black. And then therefore you were supposed to read this as black people. 
And thus his argument rests solely on this hieroglyph here uh, in the ancient Egyptian uh, writing script. So we are going to discuss this, you know, uh, we'll get to this, you know, towards the end, but there's, there's certain things that we have to understand about the hieroglyphs themselves and how to read the determinative slash classifiers. And this is what is going to be our focus uh, on today. So what I'm going to end up doing is sharing my screen. Let me get that off of there. And let me see here. And peace to uh, Infinite Minds and Zane Montego is in the building. Peace and blessings to you all. Thank you all for joining the conversation. So y'all are about to get an advanced lesson on the, the hieroglyphic script. And so uh, let me just go full screen. And let me go back because I think I'm gonna go full screen here as well. So uh, we'll just start from the beginning and we will get busy so uh let me just make sure everything is kosher all righty all right so uh today's lesson in terms of the grammar of the classifiers a lesson in reading the classifiers for semantic clarity right and just to let you know that we do have a patreon page and this is the patreon link consider joining uh it is your continued financial support that allows for these lessons and also you'll be contributing to the development of the documentary film that i'm working on titled china into and where we talk about the relationship between ancient egypt and modern black african societies so we have just started our first wave of interviews and so you get a clip of one of the interviews on the patreon page now and as i'm interviewing i'll, I'll download raw footage snippets you know for those of you who support uh, as we you know work on our proof of concept trailer so uh, make sure you support us at patreon and this conversation of course is brought to you by race and identity in ancient egypt volume one towards a meaning for the place named kemet this is a book that was just released this month and you can find it in two locations of course on my website at disarmhotep.com as well as amazon.com and this lesson is discussed in this text and it's, it's a small section in chapter three. There's more in that section, although it's small, than what I'm going to cover here today. However, um, you can find it for those of you who are who have already purchased and received your books. And there's three people who hasn't received their pre-orders yet, and you're on the second wave. And I do apologize for that, but it, it will be coming soon. But anyway, so... It's going to be in chapter three for those of you who have this uh, text already in your arsenal. Uh, you're already ahead of the game. And so, of course, I uh, just want to mention, you know, out of this deep research that is compiled here in race and identity in ancient Egypt comes this uh, initiative that I call Chikam, uh, which is a an Afrocentric philosophy paradigm and praxis uh, grounded in agriculture and, you know, developing a social system rooted in agriculture in terms of its practice, but also as a model, you know, for living. So we will we'll be discussing this all throughout the year. So let's let's get to the definition of Kemet. So if you are unfamiliar with me, uh, you know, this is this will be an alternative to what you're probably used to when you're hearing about the word Kemet, because uh, when you read the popular Egyptological work, they'll define the word Kemet, the place name Kemet, as the black land. 
in reference to the color of the soil. And then there is those of the Diopian school. Uh, that's, that is the Shek onto Diop, that's Diopian uh, school, who argue that the word Kemet means black people. And after a thorough analysis, I have concluded, A, that, you know, researchers who hold these two hypotheses uh, have not demonstrated, you know, uh, based on the valid research criteria, uh, that those meanings are supported by the extant uh, text or through a linguistic analysis. And B, that this word has nothing to do with blackness at all. Um, and we'll get to that in just a moment. And so I have defined the word Kemet to mean a pasturage with an abundance of grass and water. And it has cognates in many different languages, but uh, you'll find it in the Sumerian language as Kiduru, which means damp brown and irrigable land, and in Chiluba and Chiankanda, piece of land, field, part of land being plowed in a day. In other words, farmland. So when we talk about a Kemet, essentially we're talking about farmland, but specifically in the context of the the kind of farmland that is the result of the flooding uh, that gets its water primarily from the flooding of a river, right? And so what I argue is that the, the word Kim in Kemet derives from a root meaning to fill, to rise, and it becomes in its nominal form complete and full. And then when it has the suffix T, then it becomes a riparian land, a farmland, et cetera. And this is the semantic uh, trajectory of the term. Of course, the uh, text, Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume 1, goes through all the proofs. And this is a, you know, graphic, you know, um, showing you what a riparian land looks like. And, you know, you're talking about the usable land, the farmland, the, the grazing land that is uh, adjacent on both sides to a river versus, you know, land that is just out in the open and in the country and gets its, its rain primarily from, uh, excuse me, it gets its water primarily from rain, right? So a riparian land refers to terrain that is adjacent to rivers and streams and is subject to periodic or occasional flooding. And that is exactly what the Nile River is, right? And we talked about that term Kidudu in Sumerian, and this is reaffirmed in the Sumerian language, not only in terms of regular sound meaning correspondences, but in terms of its uses and definition within the culture. So Kidudu specifically refers to a plot of land that has been conveniently inundated that means flooded before plowing can take place. So a, a kind of farmland that is that is based on um, the the flooding or the inundation of a river, right? And this is the source for which this is given, and this is the author here. And I want some of them books in the background, but that's another conversation. And you know, in the text, you will also get this graphic here, and it will show you the semantic trajectory of how the word um, Kim evolved into these different semantic themes as well, all deriving from a, a more archaic word, meaning foot um, and limb of the body, right? So we'll skip that for now. So for those of you who are new to the, hiero the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic script, this is the word Kemet that is at the center of you know, all the controversy and the like. And on the left-hand side where you see the green hieroglyph, this is the I6 glyph that has the consonant sequence value of KM. The ancient Egyptians, to our knowledge, did not write out the vowels in the language. So you get the consonant sequence uh, or you just get consonants in the skip. 
the script itself. So you can have a biliteral, which is this green here, meaning that it has two consonant values in sequence like this KM. And then you have a monoliteral, which is this um, glyph right here, the owl, and it just represents the M sound. Then we have this glyph here, this orange glyph, which is supposed to uh, represent a loaf of bread. And um, it has the uh, T value. And then you have these kind of uh, ideograms here, but have a, a more complex uh, series of consonants that represent it. So this right here is a classifier. Um, in the old literature, you, you'll see it written as the word determinative. And these, this is the 049 glyph, and it, it represents the newt uh, pronunciation, and that's how we say it in Egyptology speak. But this grapheme here, this, uh, if you can see my mouse twirling around it, it does not, it is not included in the pronunciation of the word. It is just an extra piece of information that tells you the context the category for which the word exists so when you see this hieroglyph the 049 newt glyph you know that this word right now is uh being is being used in the context of a place name because this sign here represents cities or the country that pertains to Egypt itself. And, and as I discuss in the text, really this uh, sign signals all the land that is connected to the Nile River. And what you see here is these so-called crossroads is in fact water channels on an open field. Um, so that's what so that's what that is, right? So so hopefully I've caught y'all up to speed. However, there are many different forms of the word Kemet. And here are just a few examples here. So the most dominant form of the word Kemet is number three that you see here that we saw beforehand. But coming in second place is these two, number one and two, uh, the, you know, that has the N23 and N36, both of these being irrigation canals. Um, in or or irrigation channels you know uh, attached to uh the uh to the land you know so um so when we discuss the word kemet often again the most dominant is going to be number three but we rarely ever if ever discuss number one and two everyone wants to jump to the other version which only exist in one papyrus so not sure if it was used in any other context throughout ancient egyptian history but what survives in terms of the relics to my knowledge there is only one source that has that other variant and that's going to be very important when it comes to our analysis right so what i want to do is to have a discussion on the signs, the how to read the signs. So, you know, here again, the classifiers or the determinatives tell you in what context the word exists. So this is letting you know Kemet here is a place name and it's just, you know, it's, it is a territory uh, associated with the Nile River. And then you have these other two variants, number one and two, that have the irrigation canal um, glyphs that let you know it's some kind of farmland, right? Um, and and so this is you know important here. It lets you know that Kemet is a what we call a hydronym. You know, uh, it is a it is a toponym associated with a a feature of the land that is associated with water channels, irrigated land and the like, right? 
So again, the most dominant form, and, and it's going to be like 97, 98%, well, probably like 97% of the time is going to be Kemet with the 049. But then you'll find these other rare examples, but these number one and two are more frequent uh, in the literature than the other rare forms, which you can probably only find like once or twice, and it depends on the context, right? So now I know this lady is looking kind of crazy in this photo, but uh, this is Dr. Orly Goldwasser, and she is a, an Egyptologist who studies the hieroglyphs from a semiotic perspective. Uh, and semiotics is a branch of linguistics that deals with signs, symbols, and meanings, right? So the she wrote a book called From Icon to Metaphor, Studies in the Semiotics of the Hieroglyphs. And she has a whole bunch of articles and a whole bunch of other texts, uh, some which I've cited in the Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume 1, right? And so when uh, trying to understand the hieroglyphs, uh, she and the determinatives, so remember that the determinatives are these signs that come at the end of the glyph. So we have this word at the bottom of the screen here, separate, right, which means quartier, gnome, or necropolis, uh, or quarter, I don't know, um, excuse me, uh, this is still in, the, in my, my French, um, but this is quarter, gnome, and necropolis, quarter, gnome, domain, or whatnot. So you can see these are two variations of the word separate, that um, the only difference is the uh, the presence of two different um, determinatives. So we have here the N23 canal here and the 049 glyph here. So we can see from this example that these two signs right here, the N23 and 049, are interchangeable, right? So these, but you don't pronounce these when it comes to the word. So these are just the signs that provide the determinatives, excuse me, the, 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 that provide the, the context for which the word that is written in these uh, other hieroglyphs that precede the classifier. And so remember in the old literature, they called them determinatives. So in this text here on pages 84 to 85, she states the following. Determinatives are related to the word preceding them in two main ways, metaphoric or metonymic, therefore categorical or schematic. Together, they form part of a domain. Sometimes the word carries two determinatives representing both axes. Any arbitrary look at the determinative in the dictionary will reveal the kind of movement we are already familiar with, from the iconic to the metaphoric to the metonymic relations. The determinative may have an iconic relationship with the preceding word or may relate to it in metaphoric or metonymic ways. And so I know that's a lot of jargon. And so remember, she's a uh, semiotic scholar as it pertains to um, signs and symbols, not only in language, but in, of course, in the written hieroglyphs. And so, you know, what we're going to be dealing with is the metaphorical and metonymic aspect, you know, of the classifiers, aka the determinatives, right? So we have, as an example here, this word written as uh, henut, which means maiden. So on this, on this left-hand side here, this glyph, these two glyphs, and these two glyphs, these are part of the pronunciation of the word. However, these two glyphs that you see my mouse, the seated 
um, child and the woman here, these are the determinatives, a.k.a. the classifiers, right? And so the there's a way to read the glyphs. And so what we learn is that there's a grammar even to the hieroglyphs, excuse me, the determinatives or the classifiers. So just like when we read the glyphs from left to right in terms of pronunci pronunciating, and actually you can read glyphs from right to left, you just read in the direction or you or you do read you start reading from the direction for which the animals or the human hieroglyphs are pointing or looking at so since in this example here the hieroglyphs uh of the young child and the woman are facing left we start our reading from the left so but we're reading from left to right so hopefully y'all get this so this is the dotted h glyph this rope this tied uh loop piece of rope and then we have uh kind of a double here so this is a biliteral that is pronounced uh well it has a consonant sequence in w so it can be nawa nowo niwi we don't know the vowels right and then it is repeated again with these hieroglyphs which are phonetic complements because this is the end uh, of water and then this is new um this jar here so it's just kind of over emphasis of hinut meaning maiden right and so again remember that that bread loaf that is pronounced uh t and so thus we have hinut and the definition is maiden and so what you see here is a what we call a meronymic classifier followed by a taxonomic classifier so usually the taxonomic classifiers are the classifiers at the very end of the word the word that the 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 glyph that is on the far right in this example right and so the if if there is a word that has more than one hieroglyph uh, as the determinatives or the classifiers, it is usually the last one that is the taxonomic classifier. That means it, it tells you the category or the taxonomy for which the entire word itself belongs to. It tells you the category, right? But this hieroglyph preceding it gives you a, a, a little bit of the schematic of the term. So you would read this as Hanut maiden in terms of the entire word, but the grammar of the determinatives, you would read this as young woman. Like that's the literal reading young woman and so this hieroglyph here represents childhood smallness or the diminutive little things like that plus the human female category here right and so what a maiden is is a young woman a young girl a virgin stuff to that nature so so they're let they're giving you some extra so just in case you were confused by what you know this word here is because we, they don't write the vowels they let you know that it is speaking about a young woman that's how you read it young woman equals maiden so uh hopefully y'all are getting this so just to see if y'all are paying attention do y'all believe that y'all got this and i know it's going to take a second but if so put a one in the chat if you know what i said makes sense and it's clear to you Ooh, do, 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 do.
do 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 Sister Tamika says that she got it. And look like she's the only one taking notes, too. Well, Zane Montego said he's taking notes. Che in the building. Peace and blessings. Thank you for joining. And so, so hopefully y'all got it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask y'all again. So now I'm going to test y'all. So we have a, a new word here. And it doesn't, I haven't put the meaning of the word here. So at the top in this kind of orangey space is the transliteration, you know, uh, yerit or a yeroyit, if you want to say it that way. So without knowing the actual meaning, based upon the grammar of the hieroglyphs, what does this word mean? What does iyarit or iyarit mean? So put it in the um in the uh the, the comments and so I'm gonna wait a second. Right. And I know there's a time delay. So you know um uh, I'm, I'm just going to pause and see if if y'all get uh, the 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 lesson here, right? So I'm gonna wait for a few more uh, guesses or suggestions. You know, look at look at the hieroglyph and and see what kind of clues that it gives you, right? What is the the man doing? And you know what is he holding in his hand, and what does that what does that usually signify, given the position of the 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 man, and what he's holding in his hand, right? And so I'm uh, I'm gonna wait. I need one more person in the chat to to give a suggestion, and don't be scared. These are these are. Uh, you know, uh, this is a classroom, right? So y'all, so y'all participation is, is warranted, right? So, so, you know, the, the idea is to, to help you to, to kind of pay attention to the, uh, to the glyphs and, and to notice the finest details. And I know that, uh, you know, y'all are probably re, uh, watching this on different devices, whether you're on your computer or on your phone. So hopefully, you know, if you're on your phone, you know, put it up to widescreen and and we go from there. Right. So, yes. So uh, the the person who who got it is learned together with Obama. And uh, sister uh, Tamika one, you know, has it. See, so yes, this word here means an old woman, and so the the meronymic classifier here, and sometimes you can argue that it is metonymic, um, and and I'll get to the definitions of what those are in in just a moment. But as you can see here. This this word here means old woman. So if you were confused by, you know, the the meaning of the word here by itself, because, again, we don't have the vowels and, and we don't speak the language natively, you know, they give you an extra clue here and they, they put these two signs here. So you read this as old woman or elder woman. Right. And so in the text, this is uh, directly from my book. And when I discuss this, I say the following. For Egyptian words that contain multiple classifiers, there is an ordered sequence where a taxonomic classifier, usually the final classifier, is preceded by a meronymic classifier. 
A case in point is the word Hanut, which we just saw, maiden, which contains a superordinate sign, A17, um, representing childhood, and a superordinate sign, B1, and those are defined in the text. I'm going to go through them here. Um, human female. The A17 glyph is the meronymic classifier. So meronymy, which comes from the Greek word meros, meaning part, and Onoma, meaning name, is a semantic relation specific to the field of linguistics and is distinguished from the similar metonymy. And so metonymy substitutes, you know, a word. So like if I say the White House uh, issued an edict today, we know literally the White House is a house, is a building that is painted white. But the White House has been substituted for the word for government or Congress or whatever. So we know that the edict is coming from leadership, you know, and, and so the space now becomes the substitute for the population, you know, that consists of the government. So that's when we talk about metonymy. That's an example of metonymy. Now, a meronym denotes an essential part or a member of something. The meronymic equations are X is a meronym of Y if X's are parts of Y's, or X is a meronym of Y if X's are members of Y's, right? This is going to be very important. We'll come back to this definition in a little bit. Thus, in our example, the childhood glyph denotes an essential part of the category maiden, which is personified by the human female classifier. A maiden is a girl or a young woman, especially an unmarried one. Thus, in this instance, the young boy or the A17 glyph represents young or small. The combination of the young boy and the woman conveys the notion of a young woman, therefore a maiden, right? So, so it is an essential part. Like it, it's not so the so the grander scheme is the woman. So we're talking about a female person, but there's a, a, a an essential characteristic of the female person, and that is she is young in comparison to this variant in which the woman the female is old so we're distinguishing between an old female and a young female in in these two examples that i just gave here so uh so you know these two characteristics and in many respects you can almost really kind of say that those uh glyphs operate on a metonymic sense but um i'll digress for now so what do you do with words that have multiple beyond two hieroglyphs? So if you look at the top of your screen, right, you'll find this word, wahadzut, fisherman or fowler, right? And I've placed all the individual determinatives or classifiers that follow the main word here because here's the the wah or waha glyph and then this is the arm this is the transliteration for the um the arm glyph and then it's suffixed by w which is the agent which would be mu in bantu for those of you uh, Bantu language speakers in the audience, right? So this is a fisherman and a fowler. So even if you didn't know what the word meant, like if, if you just saw this by itself, you would know that there is, you know, at, at minimum, it has something to do with birds and fish, right? But they give you some some extra clues here. Right. So we know the G39 glyph here, Marinim, because part or whole relationship to the act of fouling. 
In the K1, the fish glyph has a part whole relationship to the act of fishing. And then this A24 glyph represents semiotically the action of force or aggression. And then, of course, our taxonomic uh, superordinate category is the, the human person himself. So let's go through this. So remember, we're reading here from left to right. And so it's giving you the, the context of even though you're, you're reading it from left to right, you'll almost kind of read it back in reverse. Right. So, of course, since the last hieroglyph is of the seated man, you know, it is of a, a man or a person in general. Right. And but it's it because it's preceded by the glyph that denotes a, a forceful action or aggression, and then it is preceded by the fish and and the the duck here or the birds. It lets you know that this is uh, a person who hunts fish and birds, right? So this this kind of the instrument that he has in his hand is a weapon. So, you know, uh, you, you know, um, I'm not sure if there's any other variations of like a person holding a spear or something to that nature, but you get the idea here. So this is a whole part relationship. This is a maronym because it is a member, you know, of uh the the larger category the, in terms of the fish and the and the bird here you know it's a part whole relationship so a wahawu a fisherman a follow is a person who hunts fish and birds that's what it's telling you right so so hopefully that is clear and so we we're going to get to our our word under examination, and that is the word Kemet. So the, the word Kemet that is written with the seated man and woman that we saw earlier in our discourse, it is, as I stated before, it is only found in one location, in one primary source, and that is the... Uh, the papyrus uh, of Calhoun. And Calhoun was a, was a kind of servant area, right? Like everywhere there's, there's work and occupation, but this was, this was known for its, is many different occupations or whatnot in terms of Calhoun. And that may play a role into how the hieroglyphs were written. So in this transliteration uh, or this transcription that you see, and I know it looks kind of busy, but understand that the original text is not written in hieroglyphs that you see here. It is written in the hieratic script. And I placed a link in the chat. It's the first, uh, matter of fact, let me pin the message. So it's pinned at the top right now. So for those of you who are interested and want to know how to recognize and write in the hieratic script, right, this is what it looks like. And, um, and the link that I posted, and that is uh, pinned to the top of the YouTube chat, it is an introduction on the, the hieratic script. So I have the in red, the two places, because I think it's actually two more renditions of this in this actual papyrus in another section. Right. But this is the most famous one that that is cited. And so when when you look at the hieroglyphs here, you know, it, it it's not going to be immediately recognizable. But this is it in the hymn to Ursa uh, Sin, uh, the third page three, if you you know have the source document 
uh, for this for the Calhoun Papyrus. And I have here squared in the blue the actual hieratic reading of the quote unquote seated man and woman, and then the the what we transcribe as the three strokes glyphs. So it doesn't look like this over here, if you can see my mouse circling here. So count one, two, three on the third row. So count down to the third row and count and, and read, uh, start from the right of the screen where you see the number five and 10, start on this side. And so count down one, two, three on the third row. And then you're going to see this variation here. That is the transcript, you know, transcribing from hieratic to hieroglyphs, the word Kemet, the place name Kemet with the seated man and woman in the three strokes. And you see another variation here, right? And what I have highlighted in the blue is this word here, meaning pot, which is like farmers or people. Uh, or, or whatnot, and you can still see those same glyphs. So when we go back here, this is one, two, three, and then four, five is the word came in here, and this is the word pot, and this is the determinative that I, ha I have highlighted in blue. So hopefully, you know, for those of you who are watching and, and, and aren't familiar with where to find the find it in the primary, this is it, right? So but you know the the reason why we have to caution about trying to use this representation of the word kemet as the main representation of the word kemet one is because you can't find it anywhere at least at least for now and even if you did find it in one other place it's still a rare writing Right. So you would you would have to find it in at least three other spots so that we can show a pattern for its usage, which we don't find in the current our current knowledge in, in our current artifacts. Right. So, you know, a, a text that I cite in Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume One, is this text titled Toponymy on the Periphery. Place names of the Eastern Desert, Red Sea, and South Sinai in Egyptian documents from the early dynastic until the end of the New Kingdom by Dr. Julian Charles Cooper. And of course, in order for me to, to do a thorough analysis of the etymology of the place name Kemet, I had to do a thorough study on toponyms. Uh, across the world and especially across Africa. And of course, we have to do it for ancient Egypt. And luckily, you know, this uh, individual here, this is actually his PhD dissertation that was made into a book. And so there's something that you just have to know about place names. And, and I'm going to read this first part here and we'll continue in the next slide. It says, uh, or I should say, Cooper says that it is, that is because the etymology of the place name now has no inherent meaning when it is used as a proper noun. It may be given a different classifier. So, so I'm going to go back and then we're going to come back there. So let's, let's go back here, right? So one of the things that I point out in the text is that Everyone who is making an argument off off top and assume that the word Kemet derives from the word Kim Black, you have no way of proving that because, as he states here, because the etymology of the place name now has no inherent meaning when it is used in a proper noun it may be given a different classifier so th because the place name of kemet for example here does not end in the classifiers for black 
you cannot just a priori make the argument that it derives from black when there are other km words in the language because once a a term um becomes a proper noun in this case a place name it loses its historical classifiers which gives you the context for how to read the the word before it right the glyphs before it so once it once it takes on a once a word takes on the characteristics of being a place name it loses its meaning and so you just can't look at the place name directly and uh and and get the meaning of the name because they're going to now replace the determinatives with with these other generic determinatives there's there's hundreds of words with these determinatives so it the 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 determinatives here just let you know the context for which the word currently now exists, but that doesn't give you any clue necessarily to its etymology. Now I argue that, um, and, and Cooper, you know, makes this point as well, that although that is the general consensus, that is also, it, it, it doesn't happen all the time. Like sometimes they'll give you clues. That's why these two hieroglyphs are very important because the earliest renditions of the word Kemet, some didn't have any determinative and the others had these two. So these two in the earliest forms of the word Kemet gives you some insight into its meaning, right? So let's go back to Cooper, right? So he continues, but the same toponym could have different classifiers depending on a host of variables, some of which would have been referent specific. Or in other words, however a scribe understood the place name affected the classifiers they chose to append to the toponym. This is an important quote. Because what he's saying here is, Sometimes when you read the hieroglyphs for words, certain words, there's a standard rendition of the word, but then there is also a variant of the word that is specific to a certain scribe. It is, it is not canon. It does not represent the consensus in terms of its application. Depending upon the scribe himself and how, the, how he or she understood the word affected what signs they would put on the, on the, uh, the toponym or on the word in general. So that is a very big thing to understand when we're having this conversation. So he re-emphasizes this, you know, uh, later on. And do I got him on it? Yeah. So he continues, these unpronounced graphemes, meaning the classifiers or the determinatives, are important for an understanding not only the larger principles of the Egyptian labeling process, but also pertinently to this thesis for demonstrating the Egyptian efforts to categorize geography by using certain classifiers. This process of classifying places reveals how scribes ordered places and accordingly how Egyptian elite culture conceived of their world spatially. And now what is bolded in the red? Conversely, these signs may also reveal different scribal traditions and paleographic tendencies rather than having any inherent effect on the meaning of the lexeme. While particular toponyms, and a toponym for the all that um, don't know is just a place name. It's just a, a synonym for place name, the name of a place, right? So and topos is Greek for, for uh, place. So uh, uh, topos, name, nim, right? While particular toponyms regularly employed the same classifier, 
the classifier for a single toponym was subject to change due to a variety of complex considerations, including textual medium, the date, the locality of the inscription, and what may be considered as scribal preference. So when we go back and we see that only one example of the, the hieroglyphs written uh, in, in, in terms of the, the place name Kemet is written with the seated man and woman, this is an example of a scribe's preference, right? And because you're not going to find it written like this anywhere else. This is a personal thing. And so when it, when it comes to doing any kind of qualitative, excuse me, any kind of quantitative research, we know that these are too few examples that we cannot, we cannot differentiate this from error. So this could be an issue of scribal preference, or it could be an issue of scribal error, which is why we, we have to have multiple copies and variants of a form to really assess the context for why it is written that way what time period, what locality, you know, what's the medium? Is it written on papyri? Is it written on a clay pot? Or is it written on a monument? Right? Like all of this plays a role into how um, the, the hieroglyphs were written. So if, for example, if myself, Sister Tamika, and Brother Zane Montego are scribes, right, in ancient Egypt during the Middle Kingdom. You know, Tamika may have her own way of writing, even though there's a standard for how to write it. But in terms of the language and grammar, but in terms of what classifiers and what words to use, that depends on my understanding of the language, which dialect I speak, and then my personal preference. In this, in this script, I'm choosing to write the word Kemet with the seated man and woman glyphs. And that's and, and it appears to be a one-off thing. So while it is interesting, it is it is insignificant when it comes to trying to make the argument, for example, that Sheikh Antijot did, that this is what the Egyptians really meant. How would D Diop or anyone know that? Because you only find it in one text, one torn up piece of text. And so if, if this was the underlying idea, Kemet with the seated man and woman, you would expect to see this on hundreds of documents and monuments because that's the understanding that the Egyptians had. But this is clearly either a scribal error or a scribal preference, right? So this is what you got to keep in mind. And I have other citations in the text that reaffirm this, that let you know that you know, scholars who study the text understand that sometimes certain words are written in a certain way just because the scribe felt like it at that moment in that day, right? So when we when we look at the term itself, and I, and I cite the full uh, section of the text in which you find this 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 word I mean, for context in the book, but we won't go over that today. So you can see in this context that we have the Maronymic classifiers. Normally, these are uh, used in a taxonomic sense. But because we have the three strokes here, normally this represents a collective context or the plural context like if you're counting objects so if i have five objects whatever the word is in um in ancient egyptian i would terminate it with with this 
uh, sign here, the three strokes, to let you know that we're dealing with multiple objects, plural. Or if we're talking about a collective idea, like, you know, like when I say that Coca-Cola, I'm not talking about a person, I'm talking about an entity that rep that that embodies you know uh hundreds uh, uh even thousands of of workers or or whatnot or like when i say congress you know or the white house i should say like if 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 i was to say the white house the white house is the it even though it is a singular object i'm talking about the government which is a collection of uh, uh of people you know who 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 run the country so that would be an example of the collective, right? And often this sign here is either going to be accompanied by a W in the word or the, the suffix T. And both W and the suffix T, which you see here represented by this loaf glyph, uh, represents both the, the, the plural and or the collective, right? But it also represents, as I discussed in the text, the, the abstract or a place. And the concept of the abstract is borrowed or an extension, a semantic extension of the concept of a place, right? So that's why grammatically is used in both those contexts. So what you see here is what I argue that this word Kemet here is being used in the context of a of a collective in terms of the nation or a country, right? And and so you you read this in the same way that it is a whole part relationship. So when we're talking about an abstract or a place, a this is a place that consists of men and women. Just like how we read in other ones, this this is part of the, the the grammatical makeup. So this is what makes it maronymic. And we can see here that the plural strokes can also replace glyphs that um, are used to represent land. Just like what we see here in this uh, this word here at the bottom. So we have remenyit, domain or department. Right. It's an it's an abstract kind of. So it's letting you know it's a place. And so you have it here, Riminwut or Riminwit. And you see the three strokes, and you also see the abstract uh glyph. So they're they're giving it to you in two ways. Right. And then in this variant of the same word, meaning domain and department. It is instead of the three strokes in the abstract, it is given with the N23 irrigated land glyph. So how does a domain or department have to do with irrigated land? Because the irrigated land is used to represent a place. And so I have on the other side of this green line that you can see right here, the word Kemet written with the N23. So we see it written like this example uh this so this domain department remenyit is written in these two forms and just like the word kemet here is written in these two forms and so when you read the actual script you do not read this as you know kemet to you right because the it is personified the 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 way that it is written in the text it is personified as the the country itself the state All right so hopefully you know this is clear and just to give you a some some added and this is in the text as well so so again this this three strokes determinative or classifier can represent the plural can represent the collective or the abstract or place and so when you see just because you see the seated man and the seated woman followed by the three strokes that does not mean that this is a plural or a collective 
Because when you read other words in the language, you know, sometimes they'll call them false plurals, which makes no, absolutely no sense. There's no reason for the Egyptians to write false plurals. It's not a false plural. They just don't understand how it is used. And so, for example, you see this word jet, meaning surf, right? Now, notice, and I should have made this bigger, right? Maybe I could. Is it possible? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this a little, little bigger so that y'all can see. So you see, you see the word digit. So remember that you read from left to right in these examples, but you you reread the the determinatives from right to left. So um, in in this instance, this is an uh, a surf is kind of an abstract category and so this is being used as the abstract which is uh further represented by the t suffix here but notice that you know saying you have a man and woman so it's letting you know a male or excuse me a female or male that works the land because that's the ta so you don't read this jadet ta but this ta is being used, this glyph here right under the snake and the loaf of bread, this land glyph here is being used as a classifier or a determinative. So what is talk with this is how you read it. A serf is the idea of a woman or a man who works the land. That's what a serf is. But notice it's surf, not serfs. It's an individual. This is in the singular, just like this word here, indigent, subject, slave, a serf. So this isn't, you don't read this as a collective because a subject is an individual person. I'm a subject. You know, if I was a slave, I'd be a slave. We'd be slaves, but I am a slave or a serf, a worker, right? So all these examples, you see that these are singular terms, a workman, anyone, someone, somebody, a conscript, a military rank, right? But they are suffix with the, with the three strokes because something else is going on besides the plural and the collective. And so this is why a careful analysis and learning how to read the uh, glyphs is important, right? And so what I say, and this is directly from my text as well, chapter three, in the section right above the where I have that other discussion, I say none of these forms are plural or collective. They are all singular constructs. And the three strokes in these instances may represent the T agent suffix. To CACS 2004 34, just as the word digit with the seated man and woman in plural strokes that you see here can represent a single serf and possess both the seated man and woman, as well as the plural and that I have in quotes here classifiers, the form Kemet with the seated man and woman with the plural strokes can represent the country in the singular with the people classifier simply representing the nation as a place. And see, Kikongo Kuma, a place, right? So these are, these are the kinds of things that, that has to be in the conversation. And so I, and I think this is the last slide. And so, you know, reading the hieroglyphs and, and understanding the grammar of the determinatives, you would have a certain type of expectation of, of if the ancient Egyptians wanted to emphasize the, the color of the land or the color of the people, you would, I would expect to see at least one rendering of what we see at the top of the screen right 
So at the top of the screen, which I have in red, these are hypothetical variants of the word Kemet. So these are not real representations. But what I did is I put it in the context of the grammar in which we know. So this, so we have the, the KM biliteral with the T monoliteral. And then after that is the D3 hair glyph. And the hair glyph is used to signify the concept of black. So uh, the, the vast majority of the words Kim that is written with the that that have the meaning of black is suffixed by the D3 hair glyph. Sometimes you it won't have a determinative, and other times it may have an abstract uh suffix, right? So the Kim determinative, excuse me, the, the Kimit word here, you would have like this would represent the concept of black, just like in the regular word for Kim. But we would expect it to have at least, you know, one of many uh, determinatives for land, like the irrigated land. And of course, this this variant here, which also means land. Right. So it, it would be red, uh, you know. Kemet, black land, just like with the young woman or elder woman, right? It would be written the same way. Or if if they were referring to like what Diop said that Kemet, you know, saying means black people, you would you would see in the uh, the grammar of the the determinatives the D three hieroglyph followed by the seated man and the seated woman. As as this would be the these would be the taxonomic glyphs and this would be the meronymic glyph or metonymic if you want to argue from that standpoint, right? Because it will be talking about the woman or the man who is black, the land which is black. This is this is in the grammar, right? And so although this is hypothetical at the top. We know for a fact that if the ancient Egyptians wanted to do this, that they would and have. So when you look at the words that I have below the green line, these are actual hieroglyphic words. So, for example, when they're talking about the god Osiris or the god Men, who is often depicted in a very pitch black color, this word Kimi, meaning the black one. How do we know? Because we have Kimi, the word here, K-M, the M phonetic complement, and then uh, the, the Nisbi here. And then we have the D3 hieroglyph for black, followed by the seated man with the long beard, which indicates either royalty or divinity, right? So it's Kimi, the black god which is exactly Osiris and men. Now this D3 sign here can also be pronounced as Ewen, and, it, and it's a word that means colorful, right? So sometimes for words dealing with just the concept of the abstract concept of color, you'll see the D3 sign, just like in, in this word here, Ewenu, right? The colorful one, talking about the sun god, Ra. So again, you see the seated man with the long beard, which represents divinity, and it's the colorful divinity, the colorful God, the sun God. Right? So these, these are actual words in the Egyptian language. If the Egyptians wanted to emphasize that the lamb was black or the, the people were black, we would expect to see on some level a, render, a rendering of these words similar in this way. Now, the D3 falling hair glyph not only denotes blackness or color in general, but it also denotes things that are bad or tragic, you know, uh, having to do socially or even physically in terms of death and the like. Right. So in this word here, irkib, it is a verb meaning to mourn, to wail, grieve, moan, the concept of grief itself, sorrow, 
and to lament, right? Which is to mourn and wail. So we see the word here, ereked. So this is the I or J transliteration, the capital A or the nasalize of uvula trio, the K glyph and the B glyph. So this, the D3 hair glyph, the falling hair glyph is a determinative. So it's not part of the word. So it just lets you know that now it's now the D3 is holding a metonymic uh, association, a schematic association dealing with tragedy. And, and this glyph here will interchange with the, the bad bird glyph. And that's another conversation for another day, right? So now, if we want to talk about uh, just like how we see here, the black one, you know, the God that is black or the black God. Here, we have a variant, Irekeb E, with the, with the same Nesby here, right? The mourner. And so, because this has to deal with mourning and tragedy, and then, of course, the seated God glyph here. So this is the, this is the taxonomic agent uh, classifier here on the bottom left hand. If you can't see my mouse circling, right. So if you read the hieroglyphs the exact same way, you know D three and and so you know the morning deity, the morning person, you know the morning whoever, right. And even in this word here is found in this word here itikeb meaning morning or to cry. And so you you have like this variant belongs in this same uh, schematic here because but now it has a seated man glyph that is pointing to his face, meaning an activity of the face, an activity of the head. Right. So so you can you can visibly see the signs of mourning when when people are crying or wailing. Right. So that's why you had a seated man pointing to the face. So it's a schematic thing going on here. And so the, the study of these different things is what's important. So, if you know, uh, I go back, if you want to learn more about, you know, how to, uh, you know, the concept of metonymy, meronymic, you know, schematics and the like, uh, there, there's a whole group, so she's not the only uh, professor in this field. Like, it's a whole field of ancient Egyptian studies uh, in Egyptology that deals with semiotics. And so, you know, you can learn more on how to read the glyphs in, in that fashion. And so, with that said, uh, I will take a few comments or questions in the, uh, in the chat. And uh, I guess I'll wait for a little, um, I'll wait for the time lapse, so to speak. And I guess I can stop sharing at the moment. So uh, any questions? Let's see. Let me scroll back up and see if there's any conversation. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So please support the channel. And so while you do that, I will actually just play my commercial. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Talk to y'all wanna know that. What's up? Feel it like I dropped the drop on car Uno. Yeah. Came to kick the door while the game man drew up. Oh, yeah. Pin game low. That's why they give me kudos. Uh -huh. Inspired by the 3 0. 595, check it for a pack like. Hit the turn price, not to a baseline. Gotta sound like I just hit the 8 5. Oh, I'm so ready. My enemies necessary. We gon' be legendary. Hold up. Mm. About to grow the payroll. So if you see the vision and you're with it, you should say so. Cause we're about building, elevating the millions. We are 
are back. And so let me go back here. Uh, um, let's see. So what is this? Sorry, do you have a theory on why the ancient Egyptians did not use vowels? I don't actually. Some people like Dr. Riketti Amin and others have proposed that because there were many different dialects, this was a way to kind of unify the different dialects or languages. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it could be possible that the hieroglyphic script is really a syllabic script, that it, it was understood certain vowels. And there was probably a convention that we just haven't recognized yet that would tell you how the vowels were alternated if if in fact that was the case that is something that is a you know a project that i plan to tackle in the future but i don't have a personal theory on why they didn't write out their vowels let me see in 750 bc the greeks added vowels to the phoenician alphabet and the combination was regarded as the initial true alphabet indeed uh, so they used classifiers instead and say mango says taking notes because i heard a theory that since there were many languages in the nile valley vowels were taken out to be more inclusive again that's i've heard that as well i don't know how i don't know how accurate that is and why they would need to do that in the first place especially if you are um if 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 you are the dominant people in that area right you you make the people conform to you and dasha rob says careful hearsay indeed say for sure i thought it was a different angle i think it deserves to be researched yeah that that takes a whole different uh type of focus since most african languages are tonal vowels don't help much vowels do and and tones do and sometimes tones signify the loss of grammatical morphemes. But that's a conversation that is beyond the scope of this conversation. So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, let me see. He says, this is just like religion. Um, I don't understand. So I'm not sure I respectfully disagree. Let's see. He says, you are confusing me. You do not explain plural or singular with clarity. The marks are either singular or plural. You are opposing Diop instead of correcting his work. Um, well, one thing you're you're trying to make two different arguments. This has nothing to do with Diop um, in terms of this particular aspect of the question. So as I stated in the in the conversation, in the presentation, I should say, is that the three strokes can represent the collective, the plural, the abstract, as well as a place. That's those are the four uh, uses. It's not necessarily that it was the singular. I'm saying that the words in let me let me go back and show you exactly what I'm I'm talking about here. Uh, so what I'm saying here in that aspect of the conversation is that uh, from current slide that the words oops so this is what I get for just doing stuff let me see where was I oh here we go so so let me, let me put it. so what I'm telling you here is that the concept of a surf is an abstract idea. You know, it is it is a it is a social construct to, to label a category of worker, right? Someone who is who is of the surf class, because there's no real concept, there's no visual that you can you can write to represent the concept of a surf you use the the three strokes here to represent the abstract it is an ab it belongs to a abstract category 
And so what I was saying is that this abstract category is used to represent a singular surf. But notice that the singular surf has a two determinatives of both the seated man and woman. So it's letting you know that this could be a man or a woman. It's not to be viewed as men and women together as a surf. So is a, a, a man or a woman who works the land. That's what a surf is. They're giving, you, they're giving you an idea of how to read it. So they're saying, so you read it backwards. The idea or the abstract category, a surf. So a jet is an abstract category denoting either a female or a male person who works the land. That's how you read this. Right. And so in here they put a uh, they just didn't put the land determinative in this variant of the word here. Right. So each one of these words here, remetch. Is that is a workman, not workers in the plural. Not workforce in the collective, see a workforce in the collective. Is, is, is a collective variant. Workers are plural, but a workman is singular, but it's, it's giving you a different type of, it's giving you a category. So that's why you have these abstracts, but it's, 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 it's telling you that it's referring to human versus a work animal, right? So it's, it belongs to the human class, but it's an abstract concept. Just like, you know, uh, Ramech Neb, anyone, someone, somebody, it is, it is, it's an abstract concept because it's, it's somebody who is not named, right? It's not a named person, it's just Ramech Neb, anyone, any person. Ramech is the word for person, human being, or man. It can refer to an abstract concept of anyone, anyone, somebody, whoever. These are abstract concepts. So that's why you see it with the, the uh, plural strokes, so-called plural strokes. I just, I like to say the three strokes instead of plural strokes because it doesn't always deal with the plural. So I hope that uh, makes sense for you. So, oop, maybe we'll do that. All right. Um, uh, how much? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I've seen somewhere that the seated man with the beard represents black Africans. Is there any truth to that? Uh, I'm I'm not sure it necessarily means black Africans. I'm pretty sure it it refers to you know, to deities as well, which don't have a color per se, or they can represent any color, um, you know, because when you'll, you'll see Osiris in a green color with the with the seated man and woman, excuse me, with the, the seated man with the beard, and you'll see him with the beard, right? And I had a whole show on, on uh, Osiris and the Jesus myth. So you can look on this channel for that uh, program. And I, and I go through the the whole netter deity and i've also written a a journal article that's going to be released soon uh on the word netter itself but it is is not necessarily a it, it means a black woman man um it, it's just it it's inspired by who we call black men because that's part of the african tradition in terms of a king or somebody of social weight uh having you know a long beard is one of the motifs um he says dasharab says or ask wouldn't the classifiers make the vowels redundant in many respects yes um but you know who knows the the true true motivations for the the classifiers in the script but we know in absence of vowels, the classifiers provide much needed uh, information regarding 
the the semiotics of the word itself the meaning the context of the word and so this is what you expect especially when you consider that the hieroglyphs uh when you don't write out the vowels it just leaves the consonants and so in a language with hundreds of thousands of words you're bound to find a number of words that had the same consonants in sequence so if you're just reading the script without the consonants it can, can be confusing so we we know that the use of the classifiers is to to provide clarity and and so but you can do that with or without the vowels it, it still would be you know because then you know we don't know if the ancient egyptian language was tonal or not so in in a, in a number of african languages tone can uh can be grammatical in in its usage so a ah can be you know in a word like dab can mean one thing but a da because of the the high tone can mean a whole different word you know or or there's a, a a semantic nuance brought about by the tone whether it's rising or falling uh or you know rising and falling or falling and rising and you know there's so many uh combinations that can be used uh he says, we're not going to learn the vowel question unless we find more diverse examples of text rather than government docs. Exactly. Uh, you can't stop people from playing with the vowels by addition or subtraction. Humans love to blend and remix given subjects and metaphors. I don't know if that has anything to do with the vowels. Uh, peace and blessings, brother. Zoo 221, Zoo Chedu in the building. And he says, like the surf, as we know, it isn't connected to the Western history of surfdom. Like I said, that that you know that's an English translation, but in the in the final analysis, it has to deal with a caste system. So it's it's a low caste, somebody who is a a farm hand, a farm worker, versus uh, someone who, for example, is a scribe. Right? You wouldn't a scribe is not of the serf class, right? and hassan and yabwile says vowels may be associated with the origin of the sound of the letter this is you this is you see replacements in other african languages by pb bw etc because of areas of closest of pronunciation i don't know about that um egypt is the name of the three known settlements in the marshes in the Nile delta kush is the empire of lower and upper region I'm just making up stuff now. Uh, let me see here. The key people are looking for is the imagination and heart. Maybe, uh, maybe just to get sort of out. Let me see. But Kenny, you merely sound like an official perspective, Alan. But it is y'all having your own conversation over here? And let me see. Even Motif isn't exactly the right word, but the bearded man is more like an idea. Uh, don't take the heart and the soul out of it like the English language does. Y'all going to have to get out of. Um, this idea that for some reason english can't translate properly african concepts um that is false first and foremost that many english words ultimately have an african origin and secondly you know again you you have to know about the 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 cultures and things as i as i stated in that previous uh, text in my previous text on orishas uh, uh netchers and whatnot that you know the 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 sign itself derives from a living example of a king the, the 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 sign itself had to deal initially with a foreigner because foreigners you know uh that was one of their their key characteristics then it was associated with kingship right and so but that's a that's a whole different conversation and i've already done a presentation and written on that and so that will take us beyond you know what we do here uh so with that there doesn't seem to be any more questions and so with that i do wish you all well and so if you have any other questions for me then don't hesitate to 
uh, hit me up on my website, asarimhotep.com. And if you haven't gotten already, get a copy of Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume 1. I'll be doing more lessons from the text. The text is 500 pages. And so there's a lot to cover, you know, in that uh, particular text. And mainly certain aspects of the language and culture that you may not have known and some stuff that was discovered as a result of doing that particular text. So with that said, y'all have a blessed day and until next time, peace.